here we are good morning everybody and uh, uh, the goal of today is to start putting together uh, the front-end application that we uh, started the, to develop uh, and uh, to create in, uh, in React uh, with the uh, server APIs that we saw last week, basically. Hmm? So I try to understand how they all fit together. Um, it will be a, a journey of different steps uh, because we need uh, you know, several ingredients to put together before we get to the end. Uh, today we'll see the basic uh, stuff uh, and next week we'll see the more say advanced stuff or, or the tricks or the problems that may arise uh, in uh, basically keeping a good synchronization between the information on the client and the information on the server okay but start let's start for the for from the first step the first step is quite easy is uh, uh, being able from uh, the browser to call an http api okay uh, right now we developed the, the, the server uh, so with all the get and push methods and so on exchanging json but how we call one of these methods once we are in our javascript code okay right now we only try to call uh, call it from the console or from the visual studio code that will issue that did issue the the, uh, the request and we saw the response uh, but all of these should be inside uh, our um, our browser so that's the goal of the fetch api hmm? Fetch is a function uh, implemented uh, in the standard library of the browsers. So all the browsers uh, uh, implement this uh, fetch method that is able to uh, call remote uh, APIs using uh, different HTTP methods uh, and uh, deliver the result of the call. Okay? Um, of course, uh, it's a asynchronous method because when we are doing a remote call it will take a, a large amount of time to respond several maybe tens or hundreds of milliseconds and so we cannot uh, imagine blocking uh, the browser for uh, for that period of time okay um, so <clears throat> the the picture we are trying to put together is that uh, uh, we have this uh, api server uh, running with the uh, express with the data which is on the database and some of the some operations on the on this data are made available through a set of routes uh, on the server side okay http routes or get methods and post methods and so on what we did last week hmm? and then we have our nice react components uh, and uh, for example uh, we will work uh, with this with our usual examples about uh, the exam list uh, uh, right now the components are displaying a list of exams that is you know, statically defined in here but we know that the real deal will be inside the database so uh, the react component should sooner or later be able to uh, ask to the server please give me the list uh, of the real exams and then maybe uh, add the new one or delete or whatever you want to do okay so we are missing a piece here how can a component uh, on in the front end uh, call a method in, in the back end? Hmm? Um, this is actually a combination of two uh, different uh, functions. Uh, one is the fetch uh, API that we're going to see first, uh, which is the basic mechanism in JavaScript for issuing a, a new HTTP call. And the second, we'll see later, um, how and when uh, this method should be called uh, inside react because we are not free to call any method when we want in react because we know the execution of the component is uh, strictly um, uh, say governed and decided by the by the react runtime uh, and uh, uh, making an external call is not something which is really functional no? it, actually it's the opposite of being functional a, a component uh, that in the middle of the code uh, we contact somewhere something outside the application to exchange some data hmm? it's the real the opposite of a functional approach so we need a, a way again to do that uh, but in a controlled way and that will be a, a special hook called use effect uh, which is a quite not difficult but it's complex because uh, there's a, a lot of uh, you know, special cases in, in use effect uh, the basic step uh, uh, is uh, this fetch method hmm? which uh, 
issues a, an asynchronous HTTP request from your JavaScript code. So this is a method that is not, for example, doesn't exist in Node.js, which we should do at other libraries. It only exists uh, in browsers. And from the, uh, the code of the browser, <coughs> we can call fetch. And it's a promise-based uh, uh, interface, as we can expect. So uh, the fetch has some parameters uh, to specify the request that we want to make. So we'll, we'll specify the URL, we'll specify the parameters, we'll specify the method, get or post or put, uh, and possibly the he request headers and the request body. Hmm? So everything that goes into the request message uh, is in the parameters of the fetch method. Then fetch will start uh, the request and will return a promise, immediately return a promise that later will resolve to a response object. Hmm? And this object, response, contains, will contain all the information about uh, uh, the decoding, let say, of the response that we got, uh, got from the server, so the status code, the headers, response headers, and the response body hmm? that we can then parse and, and convert and so on. Hmm? So it's a normal, basically, once we are familiar with promises, since we are familiar with promises, it's a normal asynchronous interface. Hmm? We, we launch a call and we wait uh, for the uh, response to be available. Hmm? Um, so this is the simplest example. When doing, let's see the, the, the right version. Uh, we are issuing a fetch call on a given URL uh, without any other parameters. This will only issue a very simple, uh, a basic get call, okay? If we don't specify mm, uh, other parameters, it will, by default, it will be a get. So this fetch will initiate, the, our browser will initiate a get to, the, to this specific web address. And uh, it will return a response. We can use a wait or we can use uh, then, okay, to process the response. When the response is uh, available, uh, there will be this response object that has a set of methods. And of course, being a promise, all the methods of this promise are asynchronous themselves. Okay, so for example, the body of the response uh, uh, can be decoded in several ways uh, and the most the common one is to decode the body of the response as it as a JSON string. So, for example, response, which came from the fetch, when the promise is resolved, and the promise is resolved when the server replies. Okay, uh, we can decode the response and use the data for something. Okay, so we use the await syntax. Everything looks uh, in looks like sequential steps. If we are using uh, uh, then and catch, uh, it would be a bit more complex because we have a, we get the response uh, in a callback, uh, and this response uh, uh, for decoding the response we call JSON, the JSON method, which itself returns a new promise, and so we are chaining when this promise of decoding the JSON is resolved. Uh, I'm executing the code here for processing the result of the promise. Okay, it's, uh, as always with the DAN method, uh, we can follow, but it's a bit more complicated because uh, there's a lot of, uh, of callbacks uh, in sequence. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic idea. Uh, the browser is still on our web page. It doesn't do anything else. That's why these uh, calls are called uh, also asynchronous. They don't modify the page. Mm -hmm. The browser usually makes uh, requests when you navigate at different pages. So you change address, and the browser makes a get to navigate to the other page. In this case, these requests are in parallel with the normal navigation. It doesn't disrupt the normal navigation. They don't go into the history. It's just something that on the side, the, the browser is also making this request, okay? And the result, of course, of this data is not processed by the browser, but by our JavaScript code. So the browser doesn't uh, analyze what is happening. It's all our work. Okay, um, the response object uh, in, in fetch uh, contains uh, some, some fields. Uh, basically, it contains uh, the status, which is the number, 
200, 404, so the status code, or the status text is, is the, you know, the, the corresponding to, to the status. Um, there's a very handy attribute which is called OK. And OK is true for every status code from 200 in the 200 area. So 200 is uh, the, the set of status code for OK, uh, the, the, the request went right. Um, so we can check it. It's a, it's a strength thing uh, we see when, when we try to code a failed uh, request. Uh, for example, if you get a 404 error or a 500 error, okay, the promise is still resolved, is not rejected. So it's a strange behavior. Uh, and then we have to check ourselves uh, whether the status code is okay. Hmm? Um, and then, okay, some other uh, attributes for getting the headers, for getting the body, and so on. Hmm? Uh, the body is not uh, immediately available. Uh, the, the documentation says it's a readable stream of the body content. It means that uh, for extracting information from the response body, we need to call a promise that will decode it asynchronously hmm? because we need to process this stream. Um, okay, but uh, uh, we can yeah, probably see it better in, in an example. Um, I, I was saying that uh, uh, the promise you know, can be resolved or rejected as normally. Uh, the reasons for rejection of a fetch promise are only uh, network problems. So if the uh, address is wrong, uh, if there, is, there are connection errors uh, or something like that. But if the exchange between the client and the server completes, completes uh, whether correctly or not, uh, the promise is resolved always. Even if the, the, the response itself contains an error. So if we were able to exchange messages and get a, an HTTP response, then the promise is resolved. So we would be in the then okay, uh, part of the promise processing. Uh, if there are some network errors, syntax errors in the URL and some, or some wrong parameters, uh, then the promise will be rejected. So we'll catch it in the, in the cache block, okay? Um, so uh, there may be cases when the promise is resolved, but the HTTP call went wrong. 404, 500 errors, all the sort of that. And we can check it uh, only, or well, let's say basically from the status attribute, or from the OK property that already uh, um, uh, do, does some comparison for us. Um, so we have, actually, we need to implement two levels of error handling when, whenever we make a call. A level based on uh, the rejection of the promise to catch, let's call them net network errors in general, and a layer, a second level, when the promise is uh, fulfilled uh, to catch, let's say, application errors, something that went wrong uh, in the application. So the, the, the Express application returned an error code. The HTTP handshake went, went right, huh? but the, the content was not okay. So these are an example of some like this, but we'll write it together. Um, but just to have an idea, we have to some code for catching the network error and inside some code for handling uh, the, uh, the case where there was some error in the response. Okay, so far from the, from the response, well, let's have a look at the, at the request. Uh, the simplest way uh, of calling fetch, uh, as we know, as we already saw, is the specifying URL, a resource to be fetched, okay? If we want to Customize something, for example, make a post instead of a get, uh, or pass some request body, and so on. We should pass a second parameter that is an object, and this object has a set of properties. For example, one of these properties is method. Method will be a string that reads get, post, put, delete, the name of the method that we want to call. So we want to, if we want to use fetch for making a post request, uh, we will send a URL of the request and then an object with a method a colon a string with, put, uh, with post inside. Hmm? 
Um, and if we are making a post, uh, we will most likely send the body in the request. So we also have a body attribute that contains a string that will be sent in the request body. And the, if the string is uh, encoded in JSON, for example, we should also add a header saying that the content type of the request is application JSON, slash JSON. Okay, so we are actually preparing the request method, headers, and body before sending them. And all of that uh, will be say, encoded in this uh, object, okay, with a, a set of properties. It's just a simple object, there's nothing asynchronous in there. Hmm? Um, here is a, there's an, a classical example of making a post call. We send the post to a given address, URL, and we pass the init object, the second parameter to fetch, with the specification of the method, and the body, the body should be a string. So if we have an object to send, we must first convert this object to, to JSON with a normal stringify method of the JSON library. And we need to specify the content type header. So headers, uh, again, is one property of the init object and itself is an object hmm? because we may specify many headers. So the one we are interested in is uh, the content type one. So it's a object with property name, content type, and value application JSON. Hmm? Remember the quotes here because content type with a dash is not a valid identifier. Hmm? And, and this will issue a post met, a call that of course uh, will be executed and returns a promise and when the promise is resolved or rejected means that uh, the, the, the call went through or not. Hmm? Um, after, after the call, we can analyze the body of the response. So sorry, we are, we are back to the response body. Uh, we saw that there was, uh, there was this uh, sorry, body attribute on the response with this readable stream. Uh, we don't want to be to work at the low level with streams, uh, so there are some methods that are able for us to already extract in, in some way, in a uh, easier way, uh, the body of the response. The plain body is uh, accessible with the text property. If, and this works uh, with any format. We just get a string uh, with the response body that was uh, set by, by the API um, call. Or if we want to, uh, if we know that the body contains a JSON string, uh, we can immediately parse the string uh, and have uh, an object in return. So it's the same as calling text and then doing json.parse. It's the same. Uh, the only um, care that we need to take is that these methods don't return a string or an object, but return a promise that will, gain that will then resolve to a string or to an object. So these are asynchronous calls here. So actually, uh, is, uh, a plain text is not the result of this method, but is the result of the promise hmm, that is returned by this method. Um, okay, but let's, I, I, I don't want to read the, uh, all the code in the slides. We'll, we'll uh, build it together, okay, to uh, we'll reason on it. Um, okay. This last slide here it only mentions that there are other libraries. So fetch is built in the browser. There are other libraries, for example, Axios is a famous one that try to simplify a bit the interface of fetch. But uh, uh, for example, uh, automatically convert to JSON and uh, automatically adds some some headers. But I think that fetch is simple enough that <laughs> it's not really necessary to have uh, other libraries to do this kind of calls. Okay, so let's get practical. Uh, remember last week uh, we had this uh, exam server, okay, uh, express application that returned, uh, sorry, I need to 
delete a couple of lines. Uh, I forgot, I forgot who did them yesterday. Um, where uh, is, this is the exact code from last week, uh, where we had uh, uh, the implementation of the get uh, list of exams uh, and post uh, a new exam. Okay, the same code from last week, uh, and uh, in so week 11, I copied over on this week. Uh, uh, exam server and we can start it okay it's running yeah yeah the sorry more like this okay thank you um, so we started that uh, and this uh, is running okay it's only response to two APIs but for us for today it's that's enough so uh, this is a server standing there and running there. Let's imagine a web application that wants to call this API. So this web application should be hosted or could be hosted by any web server, not this one. This one is only hosting the HTTP calls. It doesn't host a website. The website will be Okay, in next hour will be React, but uh, maybe in any any other no, um, website. So what we can do to, to simulate that condition when another website is trying to call these APIs is to create another project. Okay, another project with Express that will serve some HTML, some JavaScript that will call this uh, API just to see how it works uh, without all the react stuff just at the basic level to understand the fetch how how the fetch is working okay so we can create another a new new folder in this in our week 11 that we can call uh, uh, I don't know um, API test or fetch test you are testing the fetch and inside this let me split the console here. Uh, we have the fetch test project. And we install another instance of Express in this other directory. So we are actually creating another website. Okay? So in the left part of the window of the console, we have the so API server running on the right side we have the uh, client we are building a client that will call this API server okay uh, by the way the only modification that I did uh, to last week's code uh, was to change the port I, I published the API server on port 3001 instead of 3000 because we want to run the website the front end on 3000 so I have to move the port of the of the server. Okay, they, ca they cannot run on the same port number. Okay, let's keep it there and let's start uh, creating. Oh, stupid me! I have to in it npm in it first, and then install. I don't know where where it was installed. Okay, right now we have the mod node modules and stuff. So we can create in this uh, fetch test uh, folder an index with our application to run. Maybe a very simple application, uh, uh, an HTML page with, a with some JavaScript code that we just execute uh, directly, no? like we did at the beginning of the course, because we only want to run the fetch uh, method and see in the console what happens what's happening okay so uh, the Express application will just be used uh, to serve uh, some static pages some HTML page and some uh, CSS page so we can just implement a minimal server that is configured to ser statically serve the content of the directory okay so it's, uh, we have to go all through const uh, express require express 
and then we have to create the application. And we have to say that this application is going just to serve statically the content of the directory. So app.user express app.static of the static directory. Okay, remember static is a middleware. Express the static. Is a middleware that uh, uh, e, uh, say uh, processes all the requests uh, to a given directory and matches the file and sends the file back. Okay, so we can create our website into a static subfolder in our server, in our website. Okay, in our test website. So West fetch test will contain in the JS that will let's say process every request by looking for a file in the static folder and uh, we can run it on port 3000 that's a minimal it should be everything probably so in the fetch test i, I can just start Something is wrong. Require the queue. Okay, it's running, but it's not doing anything. Uh, to serve something, we we should uh, create some file in the static directory. For example, a very simple HTML template index HTML like that. Yeah, it works. Let's check. Okay, so to check whether this website is working, we just open 3000 port. Okay, it works. It's a, it's a good message. Hmm? So let's make it a bit smaller. So right now we just created a simple HTML page and we are, we are publishing them statically from a static directory using Express. Why did I do all of this? Uh, there's a very simple reason. I, so my question could be, why couldn't you just create an HTML file and open it with the browser? The response is that the, the um, JavaScript code that you run from your computer, from your local file system, so if you open directly the HTML file, has uh, some uh, hard security restrictions. So fetch will be prohibited from local files. So we need uh, the JavaScript to be actually hosted by some website, uh, or otherwise the browser will not let you do fetch calls. But this is the normal case, okay? Normally, every website should be published somewhere. So the fact that we may open local files uh, in HTML and JavaScript is just a, mm, a special case, but it's not mm, guaranteed to work. Okay, uh, what can we do? We can transform this page into something that will show the list of exams of the fetch. Mm. Let's do something very, very minimal. Uh, maybe we can add uh, one button called the load. And we may have uh, maybe a div where we want to show the result uh, that what, what we are loading. Okay. So when the user clicks on the load button, we want to execute the fetch comment, call the IPA server, which is running here, get the JSON result, and print the list of exams. We don't want to do fancy formatting tables. Just sh sh uh, check whether the data is there okay uh, okay for doing that we must mark some id load button and the uh, div should contain an id of uh, mm, result uh, where we want to store where, where we want to see the result and now our work will be will move to 
main.js. We don't have any style sheet, so we can comment that. That will, let's say, give some behavior to this button. Okay, let's check. Okay, we created a load button that right now it does nothing, but we want to uh, trigger a fetch when we press this button. So we create inside the static directory a second file, main.js file this time. And uh, um, remember what we did uh, before React, uh, we must uh, uh, register an event handler on the document loaded event. Uh, and in this document loaded, we can attach event handler to the buttons and so on. So it was something like uh, window dot uh, add even listener, and the event was uh, uh, DOM content loaded. Do you remember the name of the event? Uh, DOM content loaded, yeah with the, this strange capitalization, DOM content load. So when the browser finishes uh, loading the DOM of the page, which is a very simple one, we issue a callback that will initialize our application. And this callback with pick the button, the load button, and associate a click event on that, even an event handler, okay? So we have uh, the document, uh, which is now, document is now ready because we, the DOM is already loaded, so we can use the document object. Before that, document doesn't exist yet. Uh, let's find the load button, get element by ID, that was called, uh, Load button, load button, yeah, load button. So this refers to the DOM node of the button, and we add a handler for the click event. Add even listener to click, and when we click, we do something. And this is where our code is going. Okay, so we get some data and put this data into the div. Uh, document dot get element by D with the result box dot uh, inner text, for example, we do something very ugly equal to data, just to check whether it's working. Okay. What do you have here? Comma expression. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so what we are doing now is that we are, we program, no, we have to reload. Clicking on load, it will fill, okay, the div with some text. Just to remind ourselves uh, how it was <laughs> working directly with the DOM, okay? Uh, yeah? Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat the question? Ah, yeah, it's, yes. It's, uh, so you can, we can use the ready event on the document object or the content loaded event on the window object, uh, they, are, they fire in slightly different uh, moments uh, because it depends on whether they are loading some external resources or not. There, there's, a, uh, there's also a load event on the window. No? Uh, Window.load is on load is another event. Window.all on load comes later because it wastes uh, until the, the resources are also loaded. So the first one that uh, triggers is this one. So the, 
the Mozilla documentation suggests to use this event because it's, it's the first that fires. Okay, it doesn't wait for other stuff to. So the DOM is ready, uh, but the some images can, may not be available yet. Uh, but um, all the nodes are already there. Um, if you go to this documentation page, uh, there are probably if a different event load should be used uh, only to detect a fully loaded page. We don't need that. Hmm? Okay, uh, so let's replace hello with the real content of the exams that we want to get. Hmm? Um, maybe not to make this call more complicated, let's define a function. Mm, I don't know, read exams. Where we actually do the call and we call this function to get the data that should be displayed. So that in this function, we will focus on making the request. So first of all, uh, the address. Uh, what is the URL that we want to call? Will be the address of the API server. Maybe let's define a const. Uh, API URL would be HTTP localhost 3001 because the this guy here is running on 3001 API version 1 that's the where the API is published and now the read exams will uh, call the endpoint uh, slash exams in get mode on this URL, so it will be API URL plus uh, uh, exams. This is the endpoint that we wish to call. And for doing that, we can call fetch on this URL. This is a very simple get method, so we don't need to specify the initialization object. Uh, fetch, remember, returns a promise. So to get the result of the promise, uh, we should either then or await. Okay, it's simple to use await, so we can get the result. So let's call it response. Await fetch. Of course, if I'm writing wait, I should make this function asynchronous. Okay, and uh, if I'm calling a synchronous function here, data will be a promise. If we want data to be the actual data, I should resolve this promise. And so put also an await here. And if I put an await here, this callback should be a sync. Right? Uh, no, so not this one, sorry. The one below. Okay, so whenever we use uh, await, uh, we, we should specify uh, all the way up uh, no, that the container function is a synchronous function. Okay. If, we do, if you don't want to do that, just use the dang method and then return the result. But in any case, this function must return a promise some way because uh, it contains a synchronous code it cannot return a synchronous value in any way okay um, and now we can analyze the response there may be two cases we have a network problem or we have an application error or the good case uh, everything is right so uh, to detect, uh, mm, let's say, errors in the calling in the network, uh, we may use uh, just a try-catch block. Uh, 
where can we can have some some exception okay that means that something went wrong maybe let's have a look at what happened what went wrong and why hmm? and uh, And then we, we decide what to return in this case. And the other case is when the call went right, but the, the HTTP result has some problem. And we see that from, uh, sorry, first we have to get the response. And then if response is okay, then we can process the response. Otherwise, there will be an application error. Maybe 404, maybe 500, maybe something else. And here can be, we are handling the network error. So here we can, for example, uh, console.log the uh, response status text. Okay, uh, it's a very raw debugging, but we know that in these two blocks we are handling two different types of errors that may happen. Let's hope they don't happen, and let's focus on what we can do when, ev when everything is okay. Okay, so process the result, process the response. We, want, we know that this get uh, will return an, a JSON encoded list uh, of XM objects. So we must first of all extract the object from the body, knowing that it's in JSON format. So we use the uh, response.json method that returns a promise. So the, the list of exams will be in the resolution of this promise. Once we have the list, uh, we may return it, and we are done. Just remember, I am returning from an asynchronous function. This really means uh, that I'm resolving the promise that the asynchronous function is implicitly creating. Okay, so I'm not returning an object, I'm resolving the, pr the, the promise created by this async function. It's still an asynchronous operation. So all this code should probably work. Let's see. And it means that here in the our event tender, we are when this so when we call this function, we are creating a promise uh, and we are executing this extraction and this instruction immediately then uh, this read exam function is uh, returning a promise and uh, we are blocked on the await instruction until the promise is resolved and the promise will be resolved here okay when okay when everything is complete when this await and this await is complete so it go all goes asynchronously Okay, let's try to save it and check what is working or not. So we reload the application, we open the console. So I reload it. Okay, make it a bit larger. And see what happens when I click on load. So it should trigger all this uh, code, okay? Okay, what I get is, uh, undefined in, as a data and an error in the console. A network error when attempting to fetch a resource. This message here came from this line, line 17. So actually the promise was rejected. And the reason for rejection is uh, coming is explained by the browser the browser is 
is writing a very strange message cross origin request blocked the same origin policy this allows reading the remote resource as uh, this url what does it mean there's a protection mechanism built in uh, by default you can if you are in a web application you can call uh, external apis only from the same server where your original javascript code came from this is called the same origin the origin of this main.js okay so the website from which this main.js came it's called the origin is this one localhost 3000 So I can only call, uh, use the fetch to call HTTP APIs by default on 3000, on localhost 3000. What I'm trying to uh, do is I'm uh, making a call to a different website, 3001. Okay, only the port is different, but it's a, it's a different website. And the server disallows that. By default, the server says I can only accept requests from code that I'm sent, uh, that I already sent you. So I, ideally, I have a website, I'm publishing some JavaScript code, and that JavaScript code may phone home, may call back to the same server where it originated. So I'm sure with this mechanism that only my code can call my API. So this mechanism requires that the API server and the web server run on the same HTTP port and, and host. And of course, this is not always desirable for several reasons. One reason is that we have different technologies for implementing the server and the client. The server will be just a simple express application and the client will be a React application. So they can never be in the same server. Or we want to make a public API that everybody can call. Like in your website, you are maybe checking some weather information or you are re uh, um, reading some information from Twitter or whatever. You want from your website to be able to call APIs to other websites. And so we have a mecha, the, uh, the uh, this course, um, cross, uh, course stands from cross origin request. It's a standard where a web server can relax this policy. So the same origin policy says, okay, we can only accept from the same origin. This is something that you know, the server blocks the request. We can tell the server, okay, be kind, accept requests also from other websites. And we may specify from which websites we, we accept requests, uh, the condition, and which method, for which maybe we can have a set of APIs that can be received by anybody, or, uh, or on some API that can only be received by some trusted website, trusted application, and so on. Uh, it's a bit strange because we are uh, saying that the JavaScript, we are, say, a course is saying we are accepting requests from a set of origins that we may certifi certify. I'm trusting this origin. So you are making a website, I'm trusting your website. So I'm listing in the course uh, configuration the URL of your website, which means that I will trust API calls not coming from your website, your website is a server, coming from any browser that received their JavaScript from your website. Okay, you have a website, you're publishing some JavaScript, this JavaScript is running on a browser, that code in the browser may, can make some API calls to another server where the course configuration trusts your origin. It's a strange uh, 
mechanism. Okay. Um, the we 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 linked you some 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 slides about uh, the course. Uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, let's say let me pick the picture here. What we are trying to do here something is something like this. Okay, we are we have our client application, which is here, running on a, a port, for example, 3000. It's not React yet, but it's the same. Uh, this gives some code to the browser, and the code is running on the browser. And the code from the browser is trying to call the API Express on 3001. This call here is normally disallowed, is blocked unless we configure the course uh, accepting a cross-origin request uh, from this server. Okay? Uh, in uh, Express, there's an easy way of uh, saying, forget about that, accept everything. And we must install, so I'm going to the server here, install a module, which is the course module, npm install course. And course, uh, you can guess it's a middleware in Express. So I go to the index.js in the server. I uh, load the course middleware. And I will install that uh, app.use course. Uh, like that. Usually, when we call the course middleware, we have uh, we may specify a lot of parameters uh, to say, okay, I'm trusting you, I'm not trusting you. From 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 a get, I'm trusting everybody. From a post, I only trusting a set of any rules uh, can be defined here. Okay, so that the server will decide whether to accept or not the request. If we don't specify anything, we are just opening the door, saying, okay, okay, everybody can call. And in development mode, it's a a good shortcut, but you know, of course, in production mode, we should be more careful. So, this should, should, let's say, let's try, resolve these problems that we saw before. So, right now, the same, we, I didn't change the client. The same code in the client is calling the same code in the server, but this time the course is, let's say, opened. That's something. Okay. Uh, what happened here is that we actually we uh, we did a get the request was uh, the get uh, API v1 exams uh, the one that we had in the code. And the response body was this JSON code here. So this is the, what the fetch did. You see that uh, um, in the network panel, it's telling us the initiation of the initiator, so the call, the trigger of this request was a fetch call here. This request di didn't come from the browser itself; it came from a fetch instruction in your code. Uh, okay, right now it's uh, it's bad because we are just printing the objects uh, into the into the text uh, so we should probably data is an object we should not just write data we should uh, maybe extract the names okay so data map uh, uh, exam Excellent name, just to make something visible. So let's reload it. OK. It's still ugly, but at least we see the name. We see that we are we have been returning. We are we have been given the right objects. OK, so this is the, the this the basic mechanism. We should decide how to handle these errors 
maybe the right thing to do is to throw the exception again so that the client code can, can use it and throw new uh, so the exception itself. So in this case, we already have an exception. We can rethrow it. And so it will be cached by the client. And here we can throw a new exception, a new uh, type exception, for example, type error. The, the normally, a fetch will return ty a type, uh, type error exception. So we can do the same with a message, for example, with the status text. Or maybe even if we had some maybe a response body describing the cause of the error, we could also put the response body there. Uh, maybe it's better. So let's imagine we have some response body, like we did in uh, when we had some problem with the database, remember? We had an exception that was used for creating a response for describing the, the cause of the error. So let's extract the, uh, the text from the response, await, response.text. So we don't know whether the response will contain just a string or a JSON object. Let's just extract the text and return it in the body of the exception. It's a one way not to hide the content of the error. Because uh, the worst that can happen is that we, you, you just discover that there was some error, but you, you lost somewhere the, the error message that may help you understand. Mm -hmm. So we are returning means uh, resolving the, uh, the promise or throwing that means rejecting the promise in an async function that will be converted in this way. Okay, and uh, let's try maybe also to add another example. We had another API for adding, so let's try a post, how it works, right? So we could create another function that will uh, execute a post instead of a get, and we see how it works. It will be, the fetch call will be a, li a, bit, a little different, of course, but the idea is the same. So we may have a async function at exam, for example, that will take an exam object. And what this function uh, uh, does is it tries uh, to send a post with this at the URL, again, which is the same as before, APA URL plus uh, um, exams. And uh, uh, so the, the structure is the same. We have try catch with the fetch inside, const uh, result, response, sorry, fetch URL. But this time we have to specify some parameters because we are making, we want to make a different request, not a get, a post. So we specify an object as a second parameter of the fetch. Uh, await, sorry, I forgot the await. Code. Okay, so what are the um, properties of the ob this object? First of all, the method. We should change the method from the default get to what we want, which is a post. Then, since we are issuing a post, we must specify the body of the request to go with the request. What are we posting? We are posting an exam object. So the body, so the body, will be a string containing the exam. Just remember exam is an object, we must convert it to a string. So json.stringify. 
Excellent. And then since we are sending um, uh, a JSON body, we should specify the header with the content type uh, of the request. So headers is an object where I only need to specify one, which is a content type. of application.json. Okay, so that should be all. So we are changing the method, setting the body, and of course, uh, specifying the encoding of the body. And this response may return correctly. Normally, we don't expect to have any uh, results from back from the post. So if uh, the response is okay, we may just uh, return. True. Okay, okay, everything was okay. Otherwise, otherwise there was some error in the execution of the um, of the post, and probably the server is returning a body with an explanation with the error message. So again, as we, as we did before, we may extract uh, the text, uh, in this case, uh, from the response as a promise, a wait. We let's print the text uh, and let's throw it. Type error. Uh, with the text. And again, if something was wrong with the network connection, we may just console.log it uh, and then we throw it for the caller to handle. But all of this is just a normal error handling. We have two levels, network errors, application errors. The real code, the real semantics of the code is just here. In a post, uh, all the work is done before, before making the call. Then if everything goes right, we have nothing to do afterwards because the work will be in the server. Okay? So uh, let's try to use this function. Maybe we add the second button to, for adding an exam. Uh, don't make me create a full form. Let's just put some okay, random data, if you agree. So in the index, uh, I will add another button. I call it add. And I call it add button. And in the JavaScript, uh, I register the event lender for this second button. Document dot get element by ID of the add button with the handler that just uh, calls uh, the um, add exam with some fake exam object. So we just create an object here on the fly with the uh, code 99ZZZ and the uh, name. Uh, is a text exam test uh, score would be Thirty 
one and uh, date is today and finally we have the CFU eight whatever so this should be more or less if I remember why the attribute that I'm expecting uh, in an exam object is not a real exam object it's just a plain object I don't need to create uh, a new exam uh, because immediately after I will convert it into JSON so I will lose uh, the object identity anyway okay. okay let's see if it's doing something let's reload this load okay we already know that we can make call load many times and we we call add it doesn't work uh, ah yes stupid the I, I don't have the even listener so uh, it's uh, get element by is okay sorry I have the button and then we have add even listener click and everything I did before and of course we have another pair of even inserts to finish here okay I'm just I just was passing a, a call back to get element of ID with <laughs> that does nothing okay no I need that to reload and then click okay so this time the post went through and we see another strange options call here what is that I didn't create that okay it's not my fault uh, actually it is uh, options is part again of the course mechanism um, course uh, treats in a different way let's say uh, read only methods from modification methods if I'm making a get get is expected not to modify anything so the browser does the get anyway and it just in case if course is doesn't agree it will get an error okay so uh, there's no uh, problem in trying to make a get in the worst case I get a course error back but in the case of a post, uh, the browser will first, that we may modify some data, the browser is checking the permission before. So first uh, is issuing uh, um, uh, options uh, call of type, okay, can I, basically, can I call a post method on you? and uh, uh, if the response to this option is uh, positive for example here we have a 204 then it means that the server will accept uh, modification calls so post get and delete on this url okay so when we are making uh, some post get or put calls uh, on a different web server than our own origin the browser will always check with a it's called the pre-flight check so before the real flight before the real post I will check whether it's allowed if it's not allowed the browser will not go do the post otherwise it will proceed with the normal post so we don't need to care about those they are generated automatically by the browser and they are responded automatically by Express you see that Express received this call and, re and responded and who did respond to this? I don't have any options throughout in my application. Well, course did. This middleware did. Okay. So it's all handled by us, uh, by the browser and by the course middleware. The real work is in the post, of course, uh, call that was received. And we can see in the browser that this post uh, contained a request body which is actually the 
JSON serialization of my object and no response. But uh, we had a response code of 200. The server did, uh, in the API server, last week we wrote uh, response.end. We just closed the connection with a positive, uh, positive return code. So ideally, this means that uh, our test exam has been added. And if we load again, yeah, it's there. So, uh, do we want to, just to answer the question, do you want to make a call to a different web server or to accept the call from different web servers? So, I, I, is the question on the client or on the server? Yes. The origin is different. Yeah. The, the, the call is to a different origin from the JavaScript code then maybe. This is something that, uh, uh, so the question was, uh, uh, in general, you know, how, how it works, this, uh, and how can I allow and control this option? From the browser point of view, this is automatic. So you, you don't need to have any control, uh, uh, and it's handled automatically. What you will uh, receive, uh, let's just, just check it. Let's disable the course on our web server, okay? So. Why did, okay, sorry, no, not this one, this one. And see what happens. So if I load the application, I didn't change anything on the application. I, I know that load fails. Let's see head. You see that the, uh, the browser did the option check. The browser was not accepting cross request. And so it, we got uh, a um, course missing the allow origin error. So in this case, the, op the, the, the server responded, sorry, I will not accept the post request. In fact, when the browser is trying that, uh, it will get an error, an exception. Okay, we, what we printed in the, co the, the browser already printed the same, uh, this allows uh, this resource and so on. And we get this error, it's a network error. And uh, so all the configuration is in the server. It's the server that decides uh, who are their friends. The browser just follows the protocol and does these checks. Uh, of course, you, you could in the browser do an explicit options call to understand in your code uh, whether uh, uh, the server accepts or not, uh, but yeah, it's an extra step. You just do the call, and if uh, an exception comes back, uh, you can handle that. Okay. Um, so, but, but uh, what, what we know is that by default, uh, no, the application server protects itself. If we want to allow a public calls, uh, we can do that. We can control that. Uh, it's difficult to have a dynamic, to configure a dynamic set of websites, okay? Um, because course, it can accept a list of, of URLs uh, for, um, so that, that will allow the, the course form from. So usually what a real website does is to open the accept course from anybody, but requires some sort of authentication. So the, AP, the, 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 the body of the request should contain an API key or something, say, so, okay that show me that you have uh, the real credential for doing that. So we try to solve it, not at the network level, but at the application level. To, if, we, if we want to have complex rules for allowing or disallowing. Okay, uh, so everything is running again. Of course, if I try to click add now, I will get an error. An error at the application level because I'm trying to add the second time the same exam. Okay, so I get the SQLite constraint error, as expected. So this means that we 
the, the path, uh, the, uh, the, the code path of, of the post is working uh, if uh, the, the, the call is successful, nothing happens. If the code uh, uh, generates uh, in the server, gen we, we see here, we have an exception that was generated in the SQLite code. We transported that into the express route. We embedded the response uh, with this code in the HTTP response that was received by the fetch and was thrown and uh, let's say shown here in the console or managed by the by the front end. So it's a long story of encapsulating a message to get it through to the place where we can really handle it. Okay, so in this case we should we should see this error and say okay, the application of uh, of messages or so on, or of, uh, of exam and so on, invalid exam or some kind of error. Okay, so this is the we didn't we don't we didn't put any React in there just to be sure to understand the mechanism of, of fetch. The only modification we did to the server was to allow the course, the cross-origin cross requests, and then we have a sort of a template for get requests and for modification requests. So if we don't have a post, we have a put, basically, actually, the same. Hmm? The put usually also has a body. Uh, a delete would, would not have any body or headers. Probably the delete uh, would contain the URL, the name of the of the exam, and so on. But we just issue a fetch comment on the same URLs that match uh, the API in the server. Okay, that's for the easy part. Hmm? Without uh, React, the next problem would be how to integrate all of this uh, in React. Uh, why is it a problem? Okay, we we get, we have these functions. Read exams, add exam. So why not just calling them? The problem is not uh, of calling them, but calling them in the right moment uh, with the right data. We cannot call them from the render code of the function. That render code should be functional in nature, should uh, only be repeatable, should be called many times, or should not have any side effects. We already sh uh, saw that with the state mechanism, uh, all the state changes should be controlled by a hook, okay? And the same goes for, and even more, goes for this sort of asynchronous call. We cannot, well, okay, you could have everything, but we will break, the, <laughs> let's say, the functionality of, of React. We can't expect to be able to call this uh, function from our code. So what can we do? So let's stop uh, our client. And let's try to move. Uh, I have here a copy of the React application exams that they copied over from week nine or something like that. Uh, it was before the routes, just to make it simple. Um, and what I could do is to, so I'm moving this to this other application exams. And let me start it. Okay, this was our old application with the change, with the delete, and the everything working locally. We now want to try to uh, link to these operations, add, edit, edit, delete, modify, and so on, uh, the real modification on the server, so calling the API. The first thing we, can, we could do is to just to copy all the operations that involve the server as functions here. So usually what I do is to create a, a file that I call API .js or whatever, okay. api.js, and inside that we may copy where is that? these two functions.
So I'm just copying into the React project uh, the function that I need. Uh, I concentrate in one file all the functions uh, for interacting with the server so that all the network code will be there. Hmm? It's there. We can import this function and then we learn how to call them. Uh, of course, we need to export them. Export. Add exam and uh, uh, read exam. And in our React, so this is just plain JavaScript code. Two functions that we already used, we can right now close them. We don't need the old client anymore. We are trying to move the client into React. And from app.js, we could normally import, uh, for example, the uh, The two function was, for example, the, the um, uh, what's the name? Read exams from API. Now we have the read exams function. We know how it, how it works. So we just <laughs> work one hour on the function, and we want to call it. We want to call it, for example, instead of this call. And this call is statically loading the list of exams uh, instead of statically loading the exam we should call the server to do that but we already knew that this instruction here was wrong was out of place didn't belong we cannot have any code outside the function components which this was just a very you know, low-level trick to have something working, but that's not the real place. We don't know where, when this code is executed. We should, in a way, control the execution of this function to initialize a state when the component is created. So we must understand the life cycle of a component, when a component is created, when it's destroyed, and when is the right moment uh, to call an, an external API for refreshing data, for loading new data, for sending data, and so on. Okay, so technically, very easy. Just have a function that calls, uh, say, fetch, and uh, the complexity is with uh, doing that in a, in a way that is consistent with how React uh, ends the components. So what we are going to do in the second hour is, will be to throw away this uh, static list and try to recover the data from, from the server. Okay? I think it's a good point here to, to have a break uh, and so that we can attack the React side uh, that will be quite long. It's not something that we can close today. Hmm? Okay. So see you after a coffee. <laughs>